Welcome to the Wisdom Check by Tabletop to Keyboard. This is going to be our bi-weekly podcast where we discuss things such as Dungeons and Dragons. Actually, I think maybe we need to turn up my mic a little bit, guys. How about some more game? More game. This is the Wisdom Check. This is the intro to end all intros. Talk about dungeons, dragons, and kids. Now, now, I don't think that's proper. This is a family show, after all. This is the intro we can use, fellas. It's good, clean fun for everyone. Welcome to the Wisdom Check, where we have wholesome conversations about the dilemmas we face every day. Nah, nah, hold on a second. I got your intro right here. Yeah, that's better. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Well, I'm right, just wrong. We're going to have guests on to talk about it. It's going to be awesome, because I said so. He is right. He did say so. I don't know. Is surf music the best music for a podcast about D&D? Fuck yeah. Okay. This just in, nobody can agree on our intro for this podcast, so we're just going to start. Welcome to the Wisdom Check. Roll for initiative. Fuck. A one. It's like every time. Hey everyone, welcome back to the part two of our conversation from July 15th, 2019 with our own DM Levi, who runs our Everstorm game that is so good. If you missed that first talk, we talked a lot about homebrew games, how to make them, how to put them together, how to get feedback, and just all the fun stuff that comes with starting your own thing. Now we're going to pick up here in the second half, and we're going to be talking about bad guys and how to make them really interesting for your players. If you find yourself liking this, please drop a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and tune in live sometime here on Monday nights at 10 p.m. on Twitch. So Levi, let's uh, move on a little bit to making quality bad guys for your homeroom. Oh, oh, I yeah. love making kind of villains. This. Now, you villains is the worst and the best. Villain. Villains yeah. is the worst and the best. Because yeah, yeah. the the worst is I never want to put him in the room with you guys because you're going to kill him. It's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we kind of discussed that in a previous wisdom check of maybe yeah. how to get him out there without getting killed. So Holograms, illusions, and scrying. That's what you do. <laughs> just just play blind. You have them <laughs> fuck with the party only at a distance yep. where they're very safe and they stay away from Parties are murder machines. So yeah, no matter how much I make that big tough fight, I've gotten down to where the big but big boss end game. I was like, I'm just steal from fucking Final Fantasy, and I'll just give this character three thousand hit points. Fuck it. <laughs> it's like round two, he's dead. What? Why is he still alive? It's got um, it's guys. <laughs> the best is when you guys like crit, and you're like, oh guys, that bar didn't move. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> We're going to be here all night. The, the joys of roll 20, where the big green bar, you hit it, you know how much damage you did, and you can't see the bar moving, and you're like, ah, yeah. oh, we're going to be here a while. Yeah, so bosses, I just, I break the game and just chuck on way too many hit points because it's, <laughs> there's no, they're not going to live. They're not going to live. But yeah, I'm sorry. I, as so I other than survivability, I though, how do you go about making a quality good bad guy for your end game? I think most people out there use a lot of modules so that bad guy's given to them but if you want to make your own Fuck how module. do you go about how do you go about <laughs> making your own strad in a way like how do you go about making that guy that's going to have that gravitas the way that some of these modules do have an end guy that kind of has some gravitas to him like, okay so how do you put that into your you got to remember that the road to hell is paved with good intentions mm -hmm. um nobody in this world has ever done something horrible just because they want to do something horrible even the worst, sickest lack of empathy, they're convinced that what they're doing is something important for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, I don't involve a ton of serial killer esque minds in my game because even if it's a person seeking to kill for trophies or something like that, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of depth there. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to have somebody like that, they have to be doing it for a reason. And in the last campaign, that reason, um, okay, I had a piece, I had an NPC given to me. 
in a backstory. So yeah. we brought in a player, and the player told me that he was a creation of somebody named Baron Grawl, and Baron Grawl was a lich shapeshifter mad scientist. I was like, okay, mad scientist. So I have a Dr. Frankenstein. So why is he? So then that then I started doing my chain. I have to go down a whole big chain of why. Why is he making? What's he trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. um, what's wrong with life that exists that he needs to make new life? And in an early iteration, I stole. I haven't read these books, but my wife told me about them. Um, I'm going to get it wrong. Wrote The Handmaid's Tale. Somebody help me out here. Margaret Atwood. Chet. You got it. Never mind. Margaret Atwood wrote the Madadam series. And then the mm -hmm. Madadam series, the first book goes into these strange creatures that talk to the storyteller who lives on a beach. And so it's revealed to you in this plot that that storyteller is a vanilla human. And these strange creatures are this new species. Hmm. And then it goes into why they exist later on. And you find out why they exist is because they were designed to be a perfect life. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. What if this guy has seen that there is no such thing as a perfect life form because they're all imperfect? What if he seeks to make a perfect one no matter what? And I, I got bored with that. I don't know. I got bored. So then I was like, fuck it. And I went back to an old Toreador concept that I've seen mm -hmm. bandied about from Vampire the Masquerade of what if you're... What if you take away the idea of art down to being made out of anything? What if the Baron is an artist? And I'm an art teacher. I can, I can rock that shit all day. So what if he's making fucked up creations because they are beautiful? Like he's only making them because he finds them beautiful. No matter how fucked up it is. And I, I established a paradigm because I thought it was, it was a lot of fun. So the paradigm for everything the Baron made is very simple. Everybody ready? Domesticated animal merged with a fucking ugly bug or no. a cephalopod. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's Every it. Yep. My favorite was the pug wig. A pug oh. ear wig. Pug oh. wig. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had so much fun photoshopping. Yeah, every anyway. time we saw a new monster, God, it's like, wow, yeah, like, horrible. I mean, wow. yeah. you didn't, and you didn't just like, you didn't just thematically make these things weird and creepy. These things were deadly. The, oh, well, they they were out for blood. But that was the, cre the creep. You realize the creep was taking Pokemon cuteness, mm -hmm. not a tiger, and not a monkey, something that's familiar, a dog. And oh, I owned a dog, and oh, so cute. And yeah, make it with an earwig. <laughs> you know what was interesting about the Baron? This whole campaign too was that <clears throat> we never interacted with him directly at any point in the entire campaign they until kill the him. Baron. If they interacted with him, they would have killed my Baron. Well, sure, sure. But what I'm saying though is, in that campaign, we interacted with him indirectly you know, through his creations, through stories about him to the point where it felt like he was ever present, even though he wasn't there in any scene. And I thought that was really well done. Like, uh, wh or what are the kind of like um, mechanisms that you had to play to create that kind of experience? Uh, no matter what, I wanted about every two or three games for you to run across a new creation of the Barons. Mm -hmm. And I, the whole idea of the Baron that he saw a great conflict playing out with the dwarven assault and he was going to use that conflict as distraction mm -hmm. so he could achieve the greatest uh achievement in his life to find the tarasque where it slept and remake it in his image so he'd rebirth the destroyer as something new and with it wipe the world clean and start again. Make it all pretty this time. Cause everything was too dull. Needs more simple pots. And, and so he then took the guise of an advisor light in the dwarven court to see to it that the invasion was continuing. To see to it like I can also offer you weapons 
that no other army could offer. And so he actually cooked up a virus and this didn't come to the light. Um, late in the game, uh, people fighting against the dwarves were falling asleep. And that's mm-hmm. because the, the Baron had cooked up a, a bacterial infection that was alive and it could move with a will airborne to purposely choose its targets. And all it did is make them sleep. Hmm. I never no. I don't think we ever figured out what was happening. You guys uh, never really took falling. to the yeah. It was actually a, a living virus that was being offered by this dwarf that was actually the Baron. Hmm. So yeah, we we ran into a uh, plant based uh, villainous NPC that was attached to the Baron, and I mm-hmm. assumed it was that character's yeah. pollen spore things we fought was doing it. Hmm. Well, there's a little bit of that too. Um, there's a lot to be said for okay. So DMs out there, I'm sure you understand that players are dumb. Um, yes, we are. <laughs> but it's not that players are dumb. It's that no one can read your mind. They read the evidence you put out there. So if players are dumb, then it's because you have presented them with a puzzle and that is how they solved it. So there is a lot to be said for. If players say something that sounds like a logical conclusion to the the breadcrumbs you put out there maybe mod what you did a little bit so it does kind of match some of their assumptions Mm -hmm. you don't have to match all their assumptions but if you match some of their assumptions then they will come to it feeling a sense of accomplishment Mm -hmm. that they have figured it out that they were right that feels fantastic And yet, you don't have to completely compromise and and give it all away. You can even hang on to it. But if you hardline, nope, you guys didn't solve it, then all you've done is build a wall. Mm -hmm. And you are proud of your wall, and everybody's mad at your wall. Who's fucking happy? Nobody. Mm -hmm. You're mad that you outsmarted the players. Well, it's easy to outsmart the players when you control everything. If you are even their five senses, you haven't outsmarted them. You Mm -hmm. have limited information to make them feel fucked over that's not a victory and that doesn't make you smart or powerful it makes you an asshole (laughs) so it's your job to present them a mystery and if they come to some interesting conclusions while they're discussing because they will literally tell you what's on their brains as they're talking you're getting an insight in their own thought process and if you can like steal it a little bit and like oh that's even a better idea that's already happened in this campaign In this campaign, the guys were all talking about something, and I was like, oh, shit. That makes more sense than what I actually had written. (laughs) Huh. I do that all the time in the game. And so, because the guys made more sense with their thought process as to what's actually happening, I changed it, and now that is what is happening, but they don't know what thing I'm talking about right now. That's true. I have no clue. Who knows when it'll happen? But now... Their assumption that they were working out as a group is canon because I like it better and it does make more sense. Right. And that's, and that is at the core what player driven plot is. It should make more sense. Everything, everything should make sense to a degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, I have rules for myself that I wrote down because I have a go to. They are all painfully aware of it. So I'm sorry, guys. Um, my go-to is I get nervous when I feel plots not moving ahead and I invent a brand new thing and throw it at them. So one of my rules for myself is when in doubt, do not make a new thing. Focus <laughs> on the old stuff. Finish off old plot threads before you chuck in a new thing. So, um, so sometimes if it makes more sense, I kind of go back and look at what they're thought they're talking about i don't know what i'm even talking about now well actually i think this is an interesting point because uh this did come up in an, an older game that you ran you ran a marvel's style game mm. of superheroes and okay, in that particular campaign i remember there were a lot of plots like if you're a plot person this was the campaign for you there were probably 18 plots each game Some everybody plots. had their own <laughs> and there were six players five six players Mm, I think six. Yeah, it was six players. Everybody had their own plot, and they were all coalescing really, really fast. And then, in mm. addition, there was the main spine plot that was happening in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I, I said, that's the one where the main spine exists, and you can ignore it if you want. 
Um, but it still keeps running in the background. Um, right. If you guys are, if anybody out there is currently following Critical Role, the main spine has been since the kickoff of this campaign a giant war, which sounds interesting, but war as a plot's not fucking interesting. It just isn't because at the end of the day for a player it's too big and you're either all soldiers or you're not and if you are soldiers you have orders Mm. and orders is not autonomy yeah orders is orders and it's not fun of all the great war movies like it's always some group of soldiers that were following orders and then shit goes awry and they have to make up their own orders until they get back to the end of the game like and that's like the only way that those war movies really work Mm -hmm. so but and just now and they're on like the I'm behind I'm not caught I'm up way behind too but like I'm at around like the like around the 60s in the episode count and they're yeah. kind of just now deciding whether or not to get involved in the war mm-hmm. yeah so it took 60 gaming sessions to see if they even give a shit about the war which they actively ran away from that long mm-hmm. so I I don't force okay I, i'm stealing this from an old friend where he, he like it's like as a dm you get this plot in your head you think is so great this world plot it's so good it becomes your baby mm-hmm. and no one likes being told that their baby is ugly but at the yeah. end of the day some people's babies their plot babies are ugly as fuck and and so always be willing to accept the DM, the, the players want nothing to do with your plot. Mm-hmm. Like nothing. Because the best thing about D&D is the free will. So if they say, fuck off to your plot, then you need to roll with it or you've taken away that freedom and that freedom is the reason we're playing. Yep, right. totally agree. That's the reason we're not playing a video game because a video game has mm-hmm. constrained rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the reasons why I was bringing up that topic though was that uh, in that particular game, we gave you some feedback saying that we felt like there was too many directions to go yeah and we didn't yes. know where to go so we we're paralyzed yes by choice yes my wife is the biggest uh proponent of that she's like do not paralyze by choice she's mm-hmm. like players want three choices they don't want any more than that i was like okay fine. It, so then i dialed it back um it's a really fascinating phenomenon because it's true in a lot of places not just gaming but also you know in how many options for soda there are yeah you know you give somebody three choices and they pick one they're happy with their choice you give them 30 choices and they pick one they're second guessing it continuously from that point on they're disappointed with what they got because who knows what that other thing could have been (laughs) i honestly derive a fucked up pleasure from scrolling netflix not watching anything (laughs) just looking at all my options Mm -hmm. (laughs) like that's it anyway um so, yeah, Biz Lab, kill your darlings. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you gotta, because they might not be that pretty. And at the end of the day, what ends up being more pretty is when you work directly with the player about kind of what they want, kind of what you want, and then it ends up becoming something new that's a discovery for both of you. Mm-hmm. That's, that's and how you I felt. things rewarded. I felt pretty strongly that way when we did Raining Bullets. Like, I had an idea of where I thought the plot was going to originally go, and then you guys kind of just... Woo, off in this other direction. I was like, okay, where are they going? I kind of, yeah. like, I slowly steered it kind of back to where it was between what I was originally doing and what you guys were doing. Yeah. And so I think it ended up as all right. But like initially I was like, man, I don't know. These guys are picking up on all the, all the other things. I wasn't sure they were like, I, I apologize. <laughs> I took an active effort to test the boundaries of my free will out the gate. <laughs> well, it was okay though it was still bit, fun, yeah. but it was yeah. it was definitely like i was like whoa these guys are heading in these other directions like i was i was uh, not prepared for Testing it but eventually well with a bad hr giger impression yes. but it was <laughs> but it was definitely like by the time it was done though it was definitely better than what i had written you know what i mean like by the time it's, it was all that's done, what makes like, it great the best, the best added moments in, definitely are, added yeah the best moments are the ones you don't see coming Mm-hmm. from the two halves dm and player working out collaboratively i mean it was to the Absolutely. point that i actually changed who the end boss of the entire story was yeah <laughs> like the guy who was supposed to be the end boss was not really the end boss it was this other guy that slowly became like the villain so yeah it was interesting because like, we're talking about writing villains like it wasn't even my villain that i wrote that ended up being the villain like 
So what is it that makes the villain then? Because there are circumstances like this that have happened in our game past where a character comes along and the players just hate that character. Oh, if and the, may or may yeah. not have been intended. Yeah, if the players like, hate that character, you have to you have to grab onto that and somehow. Mm-hmm. So, um, like uh, Blaine was designed to be hated, mm-hmm. and then uh, I, I brought in a. I, I even like made the character portrait like a blonde, cocky guy from an eighties movie, mm-hmm. uh, and I wanted Blaine to be the rival character that they hated. And, and they just wanted to die so badly. And all he did was insult them with place. arrogance. Yeah. Yes, he did. And uh, so then where can that go? That can't go anywhere. And so since Blaine was a rival, I then made Blaine later sympathetic mm-hmm. and then kind of an ally. The old and that Jamie ended up Lannister. Getting, uh, yeah, it became a mm-hmm. Jamie Lannister kind of thing. Yeah, shit! I didn't even realize that. It was that. really good. Yeah, it was, it was good, very yeah. Jamie Lannister. I, I think yep. I cut his legs off, right? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he was yeah. wheelchair bound in the end. Yep. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that was uh, that was kind of what happened with Blaine, and then um, the Scale Brigade. Yeah, you guys never knew about this. The Scale Brigade Ooh. was. Yeah, I can tell this now. It's that long ago. <laughs> Gale Brigade was an army of draconian warriors that landed and just invaded. And what no one knows is that it was two, no, it was three dragons mm-hmm. that together had committed so many crimes against their own people, or they were so problematic that the three were rendered sterile. Hmm as a punishment and because they couldn't have kids they actively chose to create their own loyal children hmm. and so that was the draconians and then they used them to conquer the world of men to sort of claim a new home for themselves so it was the idea of the grieving parent Mm-hmm. And uh, my pain is so great that I don't that no one else's pain, no matter how much I cause, will even come close to mine. And so it is not important. And I'll do anything for these children that are loyal to me. Mm-hmm. And so I'll take my children. We will forge a new land, and I will build the home I wanted, even if it's not what I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. And that was the whole reason Scale Brigade invaded. Which is build. so crazy because that completely like retcons my whole background. I wrote for Wilhelm unknowingly. <laughs> like, there was whole parts of that that's so different. Like you say that now, and I look back at my own background that I wrote all like what it was it ten pages? Like yeah, Wilhelm's background went on forever. And like by the time it was done, I was like, you know, that that is completely not what Wilhelm was actually doing but in there. It but, doesn't yeah. matter because from mm-hmm. Wilhelm's perspective, it was accurate because yeah. mm-hmm. they were so insane with anger and hatred. That it was beyond this. Uh, see, I know at the end of the day, I'm supposed to read into these other races, elves, dwarves, and see it from their perspective. But how could I? I am human. So all I can do is for a dwarf to see things from a human perspective that happens to be more greedy, meticulous, and business minded. Or from an elven perspective, from an older person that thinks everyone around them is a child. So some races I just can't get behind. Like um, the evil dragons, it's hard to wrap your brain around. Mm. Like how do you... Black dragons are cruel for the sake of being cruel. Well, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? (laughs) Wait. You get off on being cruel, okay? They're they're designed Why? for the purpose of feeling yeah. perfectly okay for slaughtering them in mass. That's what they're yeah, basically. Yeah, I built guess. For, right? But like, then, like, that's players, not you can enough. You into their home and you can steal their stuff and kill yeah, them and, and feel, feel like remorseless. Okay but like, I'm out. sorry, the villains gotta. It's gotta make some sense, or else it doesn't make any sense. So I've got to know why the villain. Does. Yeah, I mean right. the dragons. Just as an aside here, uh, in kind of cultural themes. They, and at least in the Christian side of things, the dragon was representative of the seven deadly sins. So it was the, the culmination of those together. So you have like amassing wealth for no purpose. Right. You, you have like the sloth of just sleeping on your gold, doing nothing. You had your gluttony of consuming anybody that came in. You had your pride. Obviously, I mean, you think of smog. You're right. like super proud. You know, so like you go down the list, they're all there. Yeah. And so, like, that was kind of the concept, I think, of the, maybe where Dungeons & Dragons pulled from. You know, so you have these, like, 
and that's fine. Elemental kind of evil. The game has changed so much now, and uh, like, I don't know. We've always run it story Mm -hmm. theatricality. Um, I've never run a puzzle gauntlet. I'm not true. It's not. I'm not Tomb of Horrors. I'm. uh, I'm theater in the park with some swords. That's you know. That's what I am. Mm-hmm. Like it, that, that little pirate cove is the closest to dungeon we've seen out of you in years. <laughs> like, yeah, and that was it was short. It was only like a few rooms and a few tunnels, and we yeah. were there. Like but it, that, that pig cave, the mud cave, or whatever we want to call it, the stink hole, as we lovingly called it. Oh, <laughs> the stink hole. That was very dungeon like. We went. That was the the same campaign with the the yeah. Baron that we talked about earlier. That was what three game sessions in the same hell hole of a yeah. pit of uh pigment and shit. And for people who maybe haven't caught a lot of our game sessions we're talking four to five hour game sessions like yeah. long game sessions of round around combat like it was it was brutal in there so that, that probably you're right the, i forgot about the steam coal i don't think of it as a dungeon but you're right that was really it was a dungeon it, it was, was a dungeon dungeons. yeah yeah um so yeah with villains DMs I think out there can... never try and use drowning rules it's pointless <sighs> yeah <laughs> pointless they'll survive they'll figure it out real fucking fast they're immortal don't bother it was that scary. was in pathfinder the yeah. the, fi- the 5e rules for drowning are a little more harsh but yeah but um so villains you know the thing we keep circling back to is goals and i, I think having a twisted amount of sympathy towards a villain is important yeah because yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. really attach to a villain if you don't have some kind of right. element connecting you to it there has it to be a reason to be hatred. They do. They do. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it doesn't have to be hatred. It, it can be like what they're doing is awful, but I at least kind of know why they're doing it, and then that makes it worse. Mm-hmm. Like if, yeah. if 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 a villain is doing something monstrous, but you know why they're doing it, and it makes sense to you, you know, yeah, and it makes sense, then you're like, they're not gonna stop. Yeah, like right. that's there. There is an end goal here. And that's more scary. That's what I was trying to do in my Exalted game with Ravana. Oh, yeah. So she scared the, the shit out of me because, like, we got to stop her. Do we? I thought we like her. Like, like I, I had a moral conundrum with this <laughs> character. Oh, so mm, that Let's brings describe what it was point. first so that okay. we can actually tell the audience what was going on. So, in this you camp- start your end, I'll pick up on my end. Go. Sure. So, in this camp, <laughs> this was an Exalted game, and I decided to make an NPC that was the juggernaut wonder woman kind of perfect warrior woman you know and she was the glue that kind of bind or bound the circle of exalted characters together so demigod level of power super soldier and she got it in her head that there was no one better to rule the world than those chosen by the most just god and so she was a culmination of righteousness and purity and moral you know, correctness. And there was a empire at play that couldn't run the things well and did monstrous things because of their weakness. And she was going to go in there through whatever means necessary to take the throne and reclaim the old world. And the players come to realize that she's going through demonic means. She's bringing villains to the world to bring down this empire. And she's totally okay with it. And they're tracking her down, trying to find her and convince her to stop. And then go ahead. And then he did something that DMs, if you can do this, always do it. He made me care about this NPC because he said that she is a lot like my real life wife. Oh, (laughs) I pulled that move. (laughs) It was a dick move, but it worked. (laughs) This has happened before. I was in a game once where the DM knew I'm not okay with clowns. Suddenly, my villain manifested as a clown. If you know, (laughs) if you know the fears, desires, or heartstrings of your players, Mm -hmm. and you can interweave them, do it. Your buy in from the player will increase immensely Mm -hmm. so once pan told me that it that this character is going to be is it actually reminds you a lot of kim in real life i was like 
in game, my character suddenly became downright fervent about saving the soul of this NPC I didn't give a fuck about before. And now I hated all of her boyfriends. <laughs> hated. <laughs> um, yep. Zombie decoy says he remembers when they used to hide pictures of Pennywise in your classroom. Oh, it really wasn't cool. It wasn't cool <laughs> at all. Oh, that's awful. Uh, it's fantastic. So yeah, I like that concept though of looking at your player characters, not just the the player themselves. Um, the but that is the thing I'll touch on here in a second. But like looking at the characters themselves and say, what is the goal of this character, and what is the perversion of that goal? Yeah, that that's good. They too. could fall into. It's like, that's what good. is the thing that could twist just wrong? Kind of like yeah. the concept of Breaking Bad. You know, yeah. like take what you're doing, but let's break you bad a little bit. And <laughs> that villain that's not evil necessarily. Yeah, man, he's pretty wrong. That I think is very interesting. Yeah, and makes me really pay attention to the villain, and it forces you as a character to anal- analyze what you're doing. Yeah, you're like, like shit. Am I a murder hobo? <laughs> and those are the hobo. <laughs> and those are the villains that you think about. It. Those are the ones we attach to the most in any other form of media as well. Like, like when you really sit down and you think about like what Infinity War did for Thanos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, oh my god, Thanos is such a different character from Avengers up until Infinity War, and then Infinity War yeah. comes. You're like, all of a sudden, you're like, Thanos was right. Fuck it. <laughs> like, yeah. You're like, nope. dude, this guy's right. He ain't he ain't just right. He's like really right. Like But you know? also but also Marvel has the same problem that I have with in that you cannot put a villain in front of the Avengers. They'll chew through him like toilet paper. Yeah. So in order for Thanos to be the big villain, they have to tease him out with mm. third oh, string character interactions that are never a major Avenger and tiny little snippets here and there. So he's never face to face with them till the mm. very, very end. Right. So we get him teased, but he's never sharing the same space because you'll lose your villain. Mm-hmm. Right. So like, and yeah, yeah and they even, did a much even better in a job where they have way more control over that than you do as a DM. <laughs> well, the cool thing is they managed to take a villain where as a reader of the comics before he was on the big screen, I was like, how are they going to do this? Mm hmm. Thanos' motivation is dumb. Like, he's in love with death herself. Okay, I get doing stuff for love. And killing half the universe because you love her, I guess is cool. But I personally don't give a fuck about that. And I don't Mm. see, like, that's just, it's weird. It's just weird. It's not an angle I can understand. It's Helen of Troy. Right, mm-hmm. but then Hello suddenly Troy, where you go with making it. it the balance argument and about right. resources, yeah. and I'm like, Marvel's genius. It like, is, you know, yeah, it's really well done. that's evil, but it makes sense. It's but tied think- to the climate change and current resource loss we deal with now. It's actually timely in a weird way, right? Mm-hmm. So it was, yeah, it was spot on. It, yeah, they I made think- him make sense. Right. And I just think that's what you have to shoot for is you have to shoot for that villain that you can understand. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. understand why he's doing what he wants to do, why he's why they're going down these paths like, you know, and like you said, if you could tie it to your players emotions, how they feel about certain things, you can draw you can draw on that and it'll give them that attachment. Because I think that's what yeah. makes your villain a villain is when the players have attachment to it. And that's where, like, I had to switch my villain in Raining Bullets because you guys didn't have attachment to the the end boss that I'd originally created. You guys yeah. built these attachments to this other thing yeah. that I had kind of had to work with and play with, and suddenly that was more important. Yeah. And so that became the thing you were attached we, to. I, we identified our destroyer. Right. Yeah. Right, you identify, yeah, you, you Ghostbusted it. You got to pick your own <laughs> destroyer, and that's basically what you do in these games. And I think that's why homebrewing just to kind of bring this thing back around here as we near the end of our time is that homebrewing gives you that ability Mm -hmm. like more so than a module does. And like we talk about player agency and DM agency and like it's, I think it is harder to do. I don't think it's impossible to do in a module, but it's harder to do when so much of that is created for you to take it and to be able to attach that to your players. It feels disposable. It feels like, why do we, why, why are we here? Or we're here because you bought that in the store and we have to do that now? 
All well, right. I mean, a lot of times players want to be in these things too, but at the same time, like for me, it's much better to have these organic villains rise up out of these things yeah, than it is totally. to than it is yeah. to you know go about it the other direction and be like, how can I make Strahd suddenly? somebody these guys don't care about or they do care about in these ways like how do you, how do you yeah. go about making that artificially happen as, instead of mm-hmm. organically happen well easiest way to piss off a player is steal his shit so uh, like that does work so God steals your shit yeah it helps <laughs> knocks you out of your house do that um, so one of the things i was going to come back to earlier that i i said i was going to talk about was uh you guys talked about playing on a player's emotions a little bit yeah now there is a dynamic there there's a trust element of course yeah Uh, but one game session in particular jumps out to me that you ran levi and that was i've I've talked to you about this one before but the the gray lands yeah we went to basically crossed over to the land of the purgatory dead basically and it was very wraith the oblivion if you've played that game system from white wolf Uh, but very just heavy emotion just the weight of inevitability and and one of the themes that got played up was that these individuals were slowly losing their identities and their memories and we ran into some past villains that we had just hated and we just beat the sh- out of them you know and we see them and there was suddenly this deep terrible like sympathy and pity for these characters that erupted out of it and it that was like one of the few scenes in role playing history where I, as a player, felt emotionally just like jarred in well, a way that really wowed me. You got weird though when you could talk to the to the purple pigs, mm-hmm. and then you had a whole moral issue. Well, with yeah, killing them because they are sentient. <laughs> it's like, are we monsters? We came down here to. So Dude, no, but I, people, yeah, yeah. So my my system DMs, um, I flipped it. So in the Greylands, all you have is a soul. You don't have a body anymore. So if you don't have a body, you don't have strength, dex, or con. So your soul form was your soul form's hit points were the combined scores of uh, wisdom, intelligence, charisma, and then uh, as you lost those scores because people were hitting you or hurting you or doing damage then um you had certain intervals where something happened and so i had it that intelligence you as you lost intelligence you lost your memories and that was like turning into sand like you start to dissolve and then uh uh, wisdom was your willpower, so you lost your uh, ability to be influenced by other people. So you could be easily convinced to do stuff. And then you became more uh, ghostly. And then the scariest one was charisma, was like losing your persona. That was like lose, you were going slowly insane. And those people started to fracture. They looked like they were broken glass. And uh, they watched a guy that was in their party with them mm-hmm. become a monstrosity, become like a broken glass screaming monster. Yeah, and, and I think for me, the, the thing that affected me so heavily is I have kind of a fear of Alzheimer's. Yeah. And so that concept of losing yes. memory and self really hit me. And okay. I don't know that it hit anybody else in the, in the group, but like for me, that whole session, I was just like, man, this is fucking heavy. <laughs> you know, dude, Sorry. this place is scary as hell. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, it was great. It was wonderful. Dude. It was one of the, my favorite gaming moments I've ever I had. I had fun making the Greylands. Like, I was like, I like this. Uh, it was vaguely inspired by an entire, wasn't a module, I forget what they call it. When they, and it's not a campaign setting. It's when they set up a, like a single book to flesh out part of the world, but it's a modular. You could put it anywhere, kind of like Ravenloft. Mm-hmm. And it was a third ed book called like Ghost Spire or something like that. It was like mm-hmm. a town where you could play as a ghost. Hmm. Oh, interesting. I was like, what if I had a town that it is not full of ghosts, but there's a place there that could open into the ghost lands, like a portal sits there. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't really a portal. You had to die. But it was like a guy that could bring you back from death. And that was actually an old character. It was Clint's old character. Yeah. Yeah. Who legitimately like 
was part ghost. That was like part of his old plot. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'll bring him back. And he's like the guy that sits at the door. He guards the river sticks, so to speak. Yeah, like, really he can take you there, keeper. but he doesn't want that job, but it's what he is. So yeah. That was yeah, fun. that was that was a good example, I think, where you didn't need a villain in the sense of a Thanos. You had a villain in the environment. Ah, yeah. Like the, com- yeah. the, the description of it, the things that were happening to people and the effect it had on those people was a villain. Yeah, yeah. That you yeah. couldn't yeah. touch, that you couldn't stop. Yeah, to me, it was more atmosphere than a villain. It, mm-hmm. I didn't find it to be as much like the villain because it wasn't like you were out there to, it was something you had to deal with. It was like an environmental hazard yeah. more than it was a, mm-hmm. but you know, that's just, it, I mean, I guess it's kind of an unseen hand in a way, but it was, to me, it was more of, this is the environment. This is the harsh conditions. It, to me, it was like being trapped yes. in the blizzard. Jay Bruce, you nailed this. Uh, Jay Bruce on it. He's got it. We always get somebody in the chat that knows what we're talking about. It's amazing. <laughs> no yeah, matter that how. Was, that was the inspiration for the Greylands. Uh, Ghost Walk and then, is what it was if you're not reading yeah. the chat. And then after that, I, I pulled heavily from the environment of... Uh, shit. The Shadowlands. The Shadowlands of <laughs> the Oblivion. Yeah. Yeah. Right, the Oblivion. <laughs> And the it, Shadowlands it, 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 of Wraith the Oblivion over. look a lot like it, the, the Shadowlands are described in in the Oblivion as looking like the Upside Down from Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now we are at danger of pressing well beyond the two hour mark at this point. Yeah. And I know that e- we three can talk and talk and we talk. We could about go yeah, for the rest of the night this way if we had to. Well, Just I'll come back and we'll do voices see. sometime. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely. It's that was uh, Stonefly was lucky enough to get to do voices with this, and it has been a it has been a hot one that people have wanted us to do again. So we'll definitely uh, find another like week it. where we can, we can like do some fun. voices. Now, um, uh, we had a lot of new people in the chat this time. So if you don't know where to find us, we're here every Monday night at 10 p.m. We also do a tabletop 5th edition homebrew game. That yeah, we you, fucking do. It's amazing. And you'll find it here on this channel as well. We'll get that schedule out for you. And if you've missed episodes and you want to go back, and we have some really amazing guests that we've had, uh, yeah. go check it out on YouTube uh, at TT2KB. And I have all of them back there. <laughs> and uh, you'll be set to go for that. It's, it's really good. And we have some fantastic uh, guests coming up, of course. And one of those, uh, since I haven't plugged it in, a, in like, what, maybe a week, uh, we've got... Satine Phoenix coming oh, August Jesus, 12th. That's crazy. And uh, she's yeah, going to be coming to crazy. join us. And it's going to be amazing. Um, going to be going to Gen Con. And we also have a giveaway we're sponsoring of a that's fantastic right. piece of art. And you can I see don't... it in the panels down there right now because I put it there this morning. So that's if you right. scroll down a little, you will see the dragon sculpt done by David Pancake and our. Uh, well, a local artist, I guess you could say local. <laughs> um, and you can, so cool. if you're at Gen Con, you can stop by his booth, 469, and you can enter to win it. Yep. And if you'll enter it there, you'll give him some information. He'll send you up on it. One of you guys will win. And if you happen not to be able to see who won there, we're going we're gonna to announce it on that Monday after Gen Con. So tune in to find out if you won. So crazy. it's going to be awesome. And if you're going to be at Gen Con, definitely look for us. We're going to be around playing games. Uh, I'll be there Saturday and Sunday for sure. And uh, I'll be there Thursday one of our... and Friday. So Thursday, Friday, oh, I'll yeah. be around. It's going to be fantastic. And um, you, you may see oh, me with Biz Lab, I can't make the convention. I, so. Oh, yeah. I we got new to. merch. It's going to be awesome. We have got... merch. Yeah, we do. So like, we got <laughs> shirts, we got mugs. I got them ordered. I accidentally it's ordered true. them while Twitch was having some kind of fit. So I'm going to get the one and only unique fucked up shirt and fucked up <gasps> mug that none of you will ever see or have. I want fucked up stuff. Soon. Oh, man. And none of you guys can get one. So uh, Aww, it's mine. fantastic. <laughs> but anyway, um, Dustin, what are you doing these days outside of the wisdom check that people can find you on? All right. Well, in order, this Thursday, I will be appearing on the Notorious DMG as friend of the show. DM Chuck is running a fourth ed D&D game where I'm going to be playing a dwarven rogue named Nigel Swiftbeard Hoppenstout, who is the 007 of the dwarven world. So 
Nice. You can look forward to that on Thursday. That'll be 9 p.m. Central Time on Notorious DMG. Uh, then on Saturday, we return for Everstorm, game 19. Yes. Good neighbor. The neighbors. What was it, Levi? You gave me the title today, and I forgot. The neighbors. The neighbors. Not to be confused with the comedy with Zach Efron and Seth Rogen. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. I hadn't even thought so, about that. <laughs> I can't help it. I love that show. Um, and then after we get done with Everstorm, I will be on Dad Bod D and D August seventh, running a one shot for their one shot community. That's the Escape ass. from Cell Block Six. Kick which ass. I have all four of my players, and boy, do I have an interesting group. I've got DM <laughs> Chuck again from Defenders of Cobalt. He is one cool. of my players. Um, nice. Thank you, Chuck. Absolutely. I, I've i got uh, D-Doug, who, if you watched the previous uh, Salt Marsh one-shot that DadBod did, he played one of the characters in that, so I got to kind of scout him out there. Nice. I got another player from that same one-shot who played Steven, who was the druid, um, but he guy by who goes by Osball, and um, he actually is he plays with a puppet. He is a puppet on screen who plays a character. It's going to be interesting. That's you see it. Awesome, it way better than you imagine. I scouted his channel. It's amazing what he does. That's, so he's that's using, pretty unique. He's he using is. a different one than the previous one. But if you haven't watched it, it's worth the price of admission. That's it's like amazing. the triumph, the insult, comic dog move. That's yes, brilliant. it kind of is. It's it's amazing. So, um, and then my fourth player is the only one I don't actually know much about yet. So, I'm, but I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be it's going to be hella fun. I think. Does the puppet have a tiny a sheet in its hand? Oh, and no. tiny dice. No, it doesn't. That'll be great. But it, oh. it, 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 it's role play inception because he's he's playing a puppet, playing a character. If that character just decided to try to pretend to be something else for a minute, you would have like. Oh my god, that's inception. I love that. So it's I'm hoping I can make it happen in my game. It's going to be so much fun. So I like that too much. So anyway, those are things you can all go check out. Um, when I'm not doing all this role playing, you can also find me at Plague State, where I play some video games, MMOs for the most part. And been helping run a guild for longer than I care to mention. So, because <laughs> we're fantastic. Old. Levi, can you give Levi. us a little synopsis of what our adventure in the Everstorm has been for people to come and get excited about and show up? Our characters gathered with their own intents and mysteries to solve, but more importantly, they needed to get out because home didn't have what they were looking for, or more importantly, they were being chased out of it. So they took to the high seas, hoping to find answers. And all they found was fear of a pirate named Peg, and the amount of people he would gather that would never come home. And so as they took out to the seas, they ended up being swallowed up by the Everstorm itself, and more importantly, a captain that seemingly wanted to find Peg against all odds and against all warnings and destroy him because of an old vendetta. And that drove them straight into an endless storm that people don't seem to return from. Except this time, our players have been taken somewhere in the heart of this mighty storm while facing off against Peg himself. And after destroying his ship, both parties were pulled to somewhere where Peg managed to get away, but our players stole his ship after their yeah, own did. crash landed on a strange island. And so now they're on the same island, gutting his ship to repair their own. And they're meeting new life forms, new nations, new creatures, and everything familiar to them, dwarves, elves, they've found here are prisoners and are called outsiders. And that's what lives beyond the Everstorm. Amazing. And that is where we are. So, and that's where we will pick up on Saturday. So, 10 p.m. Actually, may start a little early this coming week, but we'll be awesome. we'll get a time out there for sure this week. So, follow us on TT2KB on Twitter. Follow us here if you haven't already, and uh, keep up with everything we have going on. And I suppose this would be a really good time for me to mention who we're going to have here next week on the Wisdom Show. Sure. Well, well, you my Next week, come in here, we have Wiley from the Wileyverse. Oh, yeah. Hi, Wileyverse. Very good. Come on by. He, Wiley plays uh, Wednesday nights, 
<laughs> and he does a dragonborn campaign. His players are all dragonborns. And That's awesome. Yeah, that is. So uh, he plays real late. It's like 11 p.m., 10 or 11 p.m. our time. So you have to stay up a little late to catch Wiley. So awesome. he will be here next week. Do we have anything um, solidified yet? Well, n- not fully. He wanted to do some talking about the new Vampire the Masquerade. So there's a lot of controversy around that game right now. Sure and I'm is. not sure why yeah. it's fully up on all of it yet. So we might talk a little bit about that, but I am going to definitely uh, nail down at least a second topic for, for next week. So nice. Well, if you guys got any suggestions in the chat, go ahead and leave those on our channel in our discord if you haven't joined that please do and uh check out the youtube channel we got for tt2kb where you can find all of our past stuff like i've mentioned like i think three times now but on there you can also leave some comments give us some ideas of things you want us to talk about uh just maybe comments about topics we've already discussed things you agree with disagree with let us know what you're thinking we may revisit some old topics at a future time and take your feedback into consideration and also voices voices give us plenty of ideas so if you yeah. guys have whacked yeah i'm ready ideas. i'm ready for the challenge <laughs> we'll <laughs> We're do one do of these again. weeks we will they won't be good but i'll do them <laughs> i got another special guest coming up soon that i haven't even told these guys about yet so Uh-oh. stay tuned for that <laughs> he's got dark secrets dark i do have secrets. dark secrets i'm always working you know that awesome well thank you all for coming thanks for coming by everybody and we'll catch you next week on monday